Okay, so welcome to this new DASI seminar about neurosymbolic AI. I want to thank Professor Davila Garcis, and sorry if my pronunciation is not correct, for very kindly accepting our invitation. Artur Davila Garcis is Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Data Science Institute at City University of London. He is the President of the Steering Committee of the Neural Symbolic Learning and Reasoning Association. He has co-authored books on neural symbolic cognitive reasoning and neural symbolic learning systems. And his research has led to publications in top tier journals and conferences in artificial intelligence, like IEEE transactions on neural networks, artificial intelligence, intelligence, new ribs, or each guy, just to name a few. Today, he is going to talk about neurosymbolic computing for accountability in AI, where he will focus on knowledge extraction as a neurosymbolic approach, as well as how knowledge extraction can contribute to increased fairness and accountability in AI. So again, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. And whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Pablo and Natalia and all for, for attending. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, as mentioned, I will focus on explainable AI or knowledge extraction, and then I'll try to um, give you my perspective of how that connects with neural symbolic AI more generally and with accountability in AI uh, even more generally um, and of great interest uh, at present. Uh, so I will try to argue given such a large number of approaches that have been proposed on explainable AI, I will try to argue that it is key to measure uh, performance of these approaches and to be able to have a metric that tell us uh, when things are not quite going as planned. And I'll try to give an example of that. So we, say that we need to measure the fidelity of an explanation with respect to the model that it's trying to explain. Um, and going back into the history of neural symbolic AI, there have been global and local methods for explanation. Initially global, more recently local. And I'll give you an example of a, a local method, clear, and a global method uh, Eric, that we have been using, and try to discuss a bit pros and cons of these approaches in relation to other uh, well-known approaches, such as Lime and SHAP, which became very popular. Um, and then I'll seek to create this connection that I mentioned between knowledge extraction, explainability, and accountability uh, in AI and then point to a few of the challenges and opportunities that are out there uh, in, in the field. Um, so neural symbolic AI um, is at the intersection of symbolic AI and sub-symbolic AI. And I think given a lot of debate and um, discussions which can become very vague about the relevance and importance of combining these two approaches. I thought I should start with this, uh, with this slide here to say that in symbolic AI, the assumption is that a symbol system or a logic has all that is needed for general intelligence. And in sub-symbolic AI, the assumption is that intelligence emerges from the brain. And so you have a neural network. So, from my perspective, a neural symbolic system combines a logic and a neural network. And uh, the paper at the bottom there provides a kind of overview of the field. Um, and as was mentioned in the introduction, there is a lot of uh, excitement uh, around the combination of neuro and symbolic approaches now. Uh, but, the, but the area goes back many, many years. So in this uh, survey here uh, at the bottom, I try to, um, together with Louis Lamb, uh, address some of the earlier work and how they relate to uh, present work.
So by the way, if you feel that you like to uh, ask a question, I think the number of people is, is small enough for us to try and, and have a more interactive uh, meeting. So please, please uh, feel free to, to interrupt or if you prefer, you can place the questions in the chat and, uh, and then I'll try and have a look at those afterwards and we'll have uh, some time for that. I need some time to check the chat and uh, give the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm still learning how to do how to do that. So combining logic and neural networks, and then there's the question of why, and uh, also the question of where deep learning sits in, in this uh, landscape. Deep learning, I'm sure you're aware, is, has been responsible for all the uh, recent success um, in AI. Uh, but there's been some interesting uh, success of hybrid systems very recently, uh, the system play, uh, playing uh, bridge and uh, um, winning against some of the best players in the, in the game. Um, so deep learning has been providing state-of-the-art performance at computer vision tasks, speech, audio, and, and also in some games. With a lot of exciting progress in language translation, language modeling, video understanding, and multimodal learning, learning from lots of uh, data, uh, low-level data. Um, but there is, I think, now an understanding that deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And that machine learning is a subset of AI. And there's been some confusion around the use of the terms. Um, and when we look at some of the issues, uh, these uh, issues listed here, they, they really um, come up uh, prominently. Robustness or lack of robustness, the increased energy consumption to train such uh, very large models, issues around fairness, especially in the case of large language models, uh, and ultimately trust, and uh, whether we can really deploy such systems if they are black box systems, as, uh, as uh, is said. Um, and you'll be familiar, if not with this uh, picture at the bottom, with other related, uh, similar, uh, different pictures, but relating to the same problem that you can perturb an image and the system will provide a uh, entirely unexpected result or classification or prediction uh, as a result of that. But this is an example of a lack of robustness, which was surprising because early in uh, the area of neural symbolic computing, we would uh, argue that robustness was the main goal of using neural networks in comparison with symbolic systems. So the DARPA program on explainable AI, XAI, was launched a number of years ago, and it used at the time this picture here, which uh, was um, quite a simplistic picture, but it conveyed the point that um, current machine learning, as in current deep learning systems. So we mustn't forget that in machine learning, there is a whole area of symbolic machine learning, which is not based on uh, neural networks. Um, you have this classification of a cat in this case, and this was seen as a black box. So you, you, you don't have an explanation as to why this is a cat. And the goal of the program was to identify features such as it has fur and so on, and use these features as an explanation for, for the conclusion. Um, I would argue that identifying such features is only part of explainable AI. And it's probably better to regard that as interpretable machine learning. Uh, but there has been a lot of progress. So the, 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 the DARPA program has been going on for, for, for a number of years now. And this link here at the bottom uh, is uh, a link to a, a journal special issue that has papers derived from the program. And there is some exciting developments there. Um, but the main point I wanted to argue is that we need more uh, when it comes to uh, referring to an explanation for a system. And, and I would argue that what we need is knowledge extraction, as in symbolic knowledge extraction from trained neural networks. 
and I'll try and tell you why that should give you more than listing those uh, features. So if we have symbolic knowledge and typically, uh, although it may have different forms of representation and different levels of expressiveness, typically they come in uh, or frequently in a if then uh, or if then else format. So you have a conjunction, if it rains and it's not very windy, then I carry my umbrella or if it rains and it's very windy, then I wear a jacket. And with these rules, if then rules, you can perform either forward reasoning where you observe that, for instance, it rains and it's very windy and you can conclude that I carry my umbrella. Um, well, in this case, there I wear my jacket. Um, or backward reasoning, uh, here I'm carrying my umbrella and so I apply the first rule, not the second, to reason backward from the conclusion to conclude that, well, it should be raining and uh, it's not very windy. So this chain of reasoning, it's this chain of reasoning, the set of steps that you get when you prove something in, in logic uh, that I would argue provides an explanation as to what a neural network or any system is, is doing. So we seek to extract such rules and then use the rules to derive such explanations which go beyond uh, the listing of uh, features. Now, knowledge extraction, this process of taking a trained neural network and deriving uh, rules from it is an integral part of the neural symbolic AI cycle, which is this part here at the bottom, the extraction part. So in the neural symbolic cycle, typically you start with some knowledge that you may have about the problem. And you use a translation algorithm to produce the initial architecture of a neural network. You then train this network with data. And so you learn a set of parameters here using backpropagation or other learning algorithms. And if you can extract through uh, the reverse operation, an algorithm that extracts knowledge from this network, then you close the cycle, you have revised knowledge and you can consolidate that into your background knowledge, which may be wrong, by the way, and you may need to revise it with the data. And the idea has always been to uh, be able to apply this cycle uh, multiple times, but we are only starting to do this because the knowledge extraction component has always been a bottleneck uh, in terms of the computational uh, complexity of the task. Uh, you may not have uh, background knowledge and decide to start here with the network and, and simply you're then given a trained network and then you can start by deriving some knowledge and then uh, consolidating it, deciding which parts of that knowledge you want to keep or reuse in a related application and so on. So you can see that this offers an interesting way of communicating with the system if this extraction happens at the right level of, uh, of abstraction, if it happens at the level of, let's say, pixels, then it's not going to be very useful. So this is one key aspect of the task. We want to derive explanations that are at the right level for communication with the outside world. And then we want to be able to apply this process multiple times and intervene in the system um, to, uh, for instance, impose fairness to or to make sense of what the system is, is doing or to uh, improve performance. Uh, hi, Artur. Sorry yeah. for the interruption. There's one sure. question in the chat. If you want, well, as you prefer, you can answer it now or wait until the end. Can you, you read it? Can you, can you yes, summarize it for me? Yeah, yeah sure. Or maybe so, if, if the person would like to unmute, that's also okay. Well, okay. So if you want, Carlos, Go ahead. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, I can uh, ask you the question then. So, so my question is, if I have, I have understood you correctly. So, what you say that you train the network and then you extract knowledge from that. 
from that network. So uh, I suppose that uh, the way you extract the knowledge and the type of, and uh, how you can extract that knowledge depends on the type of network architecture. For example, if it's a fit forward neural network or a convolutional neural, neural network, I suppose the way you extract that knowledge is different. So for example, uh, is it better to have a neural network uh, with a type of inductive bias, like for example, a graph neural network, a transformer, or even this type of neurosymbolic, uh, let's say architecture like uh, neural logic machines that are mm. able to structure knowledge in such a way that is more amenable to interpretation, let's say. So it, it, is that better to have, let's say, a convolutional neural network and try to extract the knowledge from that? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I think that's an important point. Um, I don't think I'll be able to say it's better to have it this way or that way. I think that the field really needs to develop in all of these directions. So you can imagine a situation where a neural network has been provided and um, you don't even have access to, to the training uh, regime from before and you just ask, try and make sense of what this system is doing. Um, and, and you're right that that gives you a harder problem than when you can constrain the network from the start, create, let's say, different modules. Uh, and, and you're right again that, for instance, approaches such as logic transfer networks and related approaches will do just that. They will um, constrain the system from the beginning in the hope that in this way you can interrogate and reuse the the system um, more readily but you may be faced with a situation where actually by doing that the performance of the unconstrained network is higher so depending on the application you will be faced with a, with a decision as to whether you would so modularity is, is is very important in computing and we are talking about computational models so this is a very strong requirement for most uh, computational models. Um, but if the performance is not as, as high and there is another requirement relating to, to very high performance, then you may need to use the, the unconstrained network and we are still learning uh, about that. So just to complement on, on what you said also exactly, you have for different networks, different uh, expressiveness in terms of the knowledge that they represent. And this is another key area for research in neurosymbolic AI, <clears throat> which is more theoretical, because this is about asking the question, well, what are the properties of a recurrent neural network and what kind of knowledge can I encode and represent? And can I represent knowledge that is more expressive in a recurrent network than in a feed forward network and, and so on and so forth. So we have some of these answers, but not, but not of course, all. And, and there's a lot that still needs to be done in this, in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks for your question. Um, right, so since I'm trying to keep this in the area of computational models and real applications, uh, I thought I should put a slide here about the neurons versus symbols debate or discussion that you may have seen in different places, uh, at least on uh, Twitter. And, and, um, and it's a bit of a risky discussion because it doesn't provide definitions. So we may be uh, talking about different things when we talk generally about neurons and symbols and symbolic AI and sub-symbolic AI. So I try to say, well, neural network, any neural network model combined with logic, any logic. And there are many different logical systems for different situations dealing with non-monotonicity, temporal, spatial aspects, uh, epistemic logic, and, and so on and so forth, common sense reasoning and so on. Um, so just just uh, when when we talk about 
neurosymbolic. We are talking about having a distributed differentiable computational model that is hopefully efficient when it comes to learning by message passing using radio descent and symbols uh, as in uh, being able to uh, recursively manipulate relations and variables with a precise semantics. So uh, what a logic gives us is a precise semantics associated a meaning and a way of calculating that um, from, from the knowledge base. Um, probabilities is, is also uh, uh, everywhere. And in my experience, it's better to keep it inside the network. Uh, you could have probabilities also at the symbolic level, but then uh, you'll have to deal with the difficult problem of mapping now between discrete and continuous models. Um, learning could be symbolic as well, but what we have seen from the deep learning revolution is precisely that learning is normally going to produce better results if done in the network with lots of data. And when we ask about reasoning, and this is another criticism that I, that I, that I have of some of the recent research, it's important to provide a definition because there are so many different kinds. And um, there's been, it, and it's good that there's been quite a lot of interest in reasoning in neural networks, um, but we need to, um, to be a bit more specific and refer to specific logical systems and, and, their, and, and, uh, and, and reasoning, uh, which is grounded on many, many years of research in this, in this area. Um, and another very interesting aspect of neural symbolic computing is what kind of reasoning can a neural network perform? Um, and our, our experience has been that yes, there is quite some uh, variety of, of, of reasoning tasks that neural networks can perform and you can try and check and, and evaluate the reasoning performance of a, of a network model. Um, but when it comes to full first order logic reasoning, um, this is more easily performed at the symbolic level, or at least we don't really know yet how to perform it at the level of the neural network. And also when it comes to go-directed reasoning. So yes, there are forms of reasoning for which we can use a neural network and then it seems to hit a wall when it comes to use a reference that is being um, receiving quite a lot of attention. It seems to hit a wall when it comes to first order logic and go-directed reasoning. And, and uh, so when we look at the logic tensor networks framework, we expect that level of reasoning to be done at the symbolic side of the neural symbolic system um, and not in the neural network. Although it is a valid research question to continue to try and see whether that can be done by neural network models. And um, so um, it's done on the symbolic side simply because at the current state, this is the, the most promising direction, right? So some kind of hybrid system. When it comes to highly expressive knowledge, some kind of hybrid system and a, a, a way of communicating between the symbolic and the sub-symbolic components. Uh, we will need to be looking at multitask curriculum and multimodal learning and setting up some benchmarks uh, to evaluate uh, the different tasks that are being talked about here. Uh, in that symbols emerge from the network and are useful to transfer across different tasks and for communication and to improve performance. Um, but some of the tasks here are different from some of the typical tasks of deep learning. So we'll need to have more um, benchmark data sets, including knowledge and data to be able to evaluate these systems. Now, going back to um, knowledge extraction, uh, this quote here is, is, is what I'm using to uh, refer to the need for fidelity, the need for measuring um, how good the explanation is. And this is the accuracy in a nutshell of the 
extracted symbolic knowledge with respect to the trained model, the neural network. Not with respect to the data, with respect to the neural network. And I argue that fidelity should precede user studies. There's been quite a strong focus on user studies in, in the area of XAI. Um, but if the fidelity is low, or if the fidelity error is very high, then we know that that explanation isn't an explanation of the network. It may be a surprising finding, and users may find that relevant, but it is not an explanation of that uh, network model. Um, and this is what we found in this paper here at the bottom, where we looked at measuring fidelity uh, of popular systems such as Lime and SHAP, and the fidelity of those systems can be very poor. So you obtain an explanation, you can evaluate it uh, through a user study, um, but it's important to be aware that the neural network is not actually providing that explanation. So it's important to know when the neural network doesn't know. Um, so let me change gear into um, uh, specific ways and just to give an example of uh, how we do this uh, knowledge extraction stuff. Um, so early on, the goal was to derive rules from neural networks and the networks would have uh, maybe hundreds of neurons. And this was already a very hard problem. Uh, now, deep networks have millions, if not billions of parameters. So global knowledge extraction became even more prohibitive. Uh, so these local methods such as Lyme and Chuck, they have a place uh, in, in this area where they seek to explain, or it may be sufficient, or it may be at least desirable if you cannot provide a global explanation for what the neural network is doing, to provide an explanation for individual cases uh, and therefore reduce the complexity. But these local methods also need to have a measure of fidelity and this is what was missed. So in the global knowledge extraction methods, there was always a, a, a measure of fidelity as a way of evaluating what these uh, systems were deriving as explanations. Uh, so the clear system, which is the first approach that I'm going to uh, talk about on uh, XAI, counterfactual local explanations via regression, is a method that is local, but also seeks to produce a measure of fidelity of the explanation with respect to the model. It's measurable, so it gives this fidelity uh, result, it's counterfactual and you derive essentially an equation instead of a set of rules. But at the end of the day, um, an equation is as good as a set of logical rules. If you look at many valued logics, that's what you have um, in, in the real space. And uh, contrastive when applied to images. Um, and this is an interesting, um, new perspective uh, that came with uh, SHAP, uh, the, this idea of producing uh, al explained alternative outcomes. This is an interesting new dimension. And so, of course, there are valid contributions from, from both Lime and SHAP to this field. So CLEAR is based on Lime. Um, Lime, in trying to explain this specific instance here, will generate some data points and weight them according to the proximity to the instance that is being explained. Uh, CLEAR doesn't do that, but it also generates uh, data points and uses regression. The Lime uses linear reg regression, CLEAR uses logistic regression um, to try and explain the local boundary here but it also uh, perturbs the data in the direction of its nearest counterfactuals. So in this direction, uh, you would change the classification 
and equally in this direction, you would change the classification when you get to that point. This is what gives us the actual perturbations, what we call actual perturbations. So the counterfactual perturbations, uh, the change needed in the data to change the classification. And it's this that we need um, to, measure, to measure fidelity. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have a multilayer perceptron uh, trained on the uh, toy diabetes data set. We have a data point uh, with values for glucose and blood pressure and a probability that this data falls into class one, which I think is diabetes uh, of 0 0.69. So for this data point, the probability of diabetes is 0 0.69. We generate a logistic regression equation. So from the data that has been sampled locally around this data point X, which we are trying to explain. And here we have that uh, equation. So we look for those parameters and we are interested in the counterfactual explanations. So we are interested in the situation where uh, W transposed X equals zero. So the smallest change needed to flip the classification. So we get to this equation here when we take blood pressure equals to 3.1. So we plug uh, blood pressure uh, 3.1. We can now calculate a value for glucose. We can do the opposite. We can plug glucose and calculate a value for blood pressure. These are going to give me the perturbations that are needed according to the regression. And so I can calculate this value and I can compare now this value, the estimated perturbation with the actual perturbation needed here by the neural network. So, uh, this is our measure of fidelity then. So we have an estimated perturbation, we have an actual one, and our fidelity error is simply the, the difference between the two. Um, so the point is that the, if the fidelity error is, very, is high, then at least we know that we don't know. <laughs> we know that this explanation is uh, not a good explanation. And, uh, the code is available here and uh, please feel free to explore it and, and let me know uh, how, how it looks like and, and whether it works in your, in your case. So um, moving on to an application, uh, we've been looking at chest X-rays, uh, COVID chest X-rays and non-COVID chest X-rays and pleural effusion and so on, where those variables, glucose and, and uh, blood pressure and so on, those are, are now segments in the image. So there's been some segmentation and now I hope to derive an equation, a regression equation that is going to explain a particular classification. This is ongoing uh, work compared with GradCam, which will produce these uh, heat maps also with Lyme. And here is clear and um, here on the left, you have images annotated by, by an expert, by a medical doctor, saying that this is the area of relevance uh, for this image. You can see that CLEAR is doing a good job there. And we were looking to compare the medically annotated images with the fidelity measures for each of these and uh, to see that we can claim that, well, we know when we don't know. As in this case here, you can see that we're still quite a long way off. The others are also not doing a very good job, um, but at least we hope to be able to say, well, this is not a good explanation. And so to improve trust, it is important to, it is important to measure how confident we are in, in the explanations that are derived from these, from these methods. Now, moving on to the uh, global method, uh, that uh, we have been looking at same X-ray images, uh, but now using a CNN. The previous uh, uh, example uses a GAN. 
Uh, here uh, you have a standard convolutional neural networks, and this is a collaboration between the Data Science Institute at City and uh, Fujitsu Research. And they have a system called ERIC for extracting relations inferred from convolutions, where they extract now for a set of images, so uh, a set of data points, so not just a single uh, data item. So um, it's global, but it's only looking, in the case of a CNN, you can afford sometimes to look only at the penultimate layer before the fully connected layers. So the, after the um, convolutions have been uh, performed. And we were trying to integrate Eric into the neural symbolic cycle, um, considering pure fusion and, and COVID. So let me tell you a little bit about Eric uh, to start with. You have um, convolutions, you have a number of images now. This is the famous celebrity data set. The neural network is classifying the images as male or female. And we look at this layer before the fully connected layers and, and um, we call those the kernels and we look at the images that activate mostly each of these kernels. And what that gives us is a way of integrating the images that activate mostly this kernel, for instance, and create some kind of heat map. So we know that this kernel is about this region here in the image. And we give it a name, LC in this case, and QE in this case. And we are trying to derive rules that look like this. So similar to the, when it rains, I carry my umbrella. If QE and so-and-so, then female. If not QE, so now I have negation as well. And you have these logic programming rules derived from the network once these symbols have been attached to a description here. What we don't have, and this is the main paper, uh, about Eric, um, they generate uh, data, use a um, decision tree algorithm instead of a regression approach, a decision tree to uh, derive these rules here from the decision tree trained from the data as a surrogate um, model, which hopefully is more explainable. What we try to do uh, in, in a very recent work was to attach some meaning to these QE and LC. What we really uh, wanted, uh, instead of a bunch of rules, is a very compact set of rules. And we can measure fidelity on this uh, set of rules. We hope to derive a very compact set of rules uh, with meaningful symbols, meaningful symbols being used there. Um, so this is what we did. We uh, plotted in the case of uh, pure effusion, so chest X-rays, um, there's a symbol FX uh, looking at this uh, left-hand side um, of the lung. And we have some rules with FX and not FX, FX and, and not FX. And we wanted to be able to have more information about what this means. And so we plotted this uh, kernel norm plots, which is if you assume a certain threshold, which may change depending on the application and which a medical doctor may decide to set, if you assume a threshold, all the examples, and here we just separate them as um, male and female, but this is basically all the examples. And we look at the extreme cases with the um, largest distance to the threshold. And we look at these extreme cases here and at the top. And we seek to compare these to define FX. And so FX uh, over here and not FX uh, down there, and an expert looking at these 
would say, well, this has to do with an enlarged heart. And uh, so FX being an enlarged heart in relation to this uh, number here, which is the normal range, and then a normal sized uh, heart. So this is what we did there. We have now uh, these chest X-ray images. We apply a CNN performs a classification for pleuroeffusion or not pleuroeffusion or a healthy uh, chest X-ray. You have a bunch of rules that will look like this, not CL and not PA implies pleuroeffusion and so on. These rules are derived from, from a nice decision tree that is the surrogate model. Um, but we we're trying to understand what CL and PA and not PA and not RA mean. Um, and when we do this uh, in the case of, for instance, this kernel um, uh, DH, uh, we basically, um, and we look at the extreme uh, cases, we find a situation where a standing posture is being used prominently for the classification of healthy. And uh, laying down is down here. So standing DH, laying down, uh, not DH. And basically the network is now using a proxy because these X-rays, they are taken using different machines and maybe you're standing up or maybe you are on, on a bed. And, and the situation is that you're more likely uh, to be unhealthy if you are uh, not capable of standing up for the, for the x-ray. So here we find a case of performing very well, the CNN performing very well, but for the wrong reason. And if we didn't know, um, then we would be using this as an explanation wrongly. Uh, another example, and now in the case of the COVID data set, the reason why we looked at COVID and pure effusion is because we hope to be able to transfer some of these concepts and rules from one task to another, which is a key uh, goal of machine learning currently. Um, grayness, so uh, AMC, uh, symbol for, for grayness was being used in the case of the COVID uh, and, and medical doctors, they do not pay attention to that. They know how to look at these uh, x-rays and ignore that, but the CNN doesn't. And it just takes the easy way out and, and classifies and uses grayness. Am I for time? How many minutes do I have? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay, no problem. I I'm, mean... I'm uh, already over, okay. I'll no, no, it's, it's perfectly okay, no worry. Please no worries. Um, so, that's what we do with Clear and Eric as just two examples of systems that um, have been used for, for explanations. Um, this work with Fujitsu will appear at the IGCNN conference uh, in a couple of months. Um, so I've talked about these two methods, simple methods, one local, one global uh, for knowledge extraction from neural networks. Again, it's very important to measure fidelity of what is being extracted. In the case of um, the uh, kernel norm visualization and in the case of the ERIC system, um, you hope to derive a tool for concept naming and explanation in radiology, transferring from uh, pure effusion uh, to uh, COVID but we're not there yet. So what we have seen from the trained networks so far is that uh, to use this as a diagnostic tool that increase trust in the system, you need to remove such concepts like grayness from the trained network. Uh, so this is one uh, aspect now to consider. The next step is, okay, having identified this issue, how do I improve the network so, uh, and constrain it so uh, it doesn't uh, use these and for instance, only use anatomically relevant concepts. 
And in the case of COVID, I think uh, it's it's quite relevant to uh, to point out that uh, AI has been a complete failure there. Um, there was a lot of excitement early on, and um, we couldn't really help solve the problem. And um, and this goes to some of the hype around AI, which we need to try and prevent. Uh, identify the great benefits and progress that has been achieved, but at the same time, look at the issues that are still there that need to be solved in order to take us to the next step of, for instance, in this case, systems that will uh, replace the radiologists. And we are far from achieving that. Um, so it's important that um, this kind of work continues uh, towards um, explainability and then trust and then deployment and finally, you know, results that will confirm all the investment in the area without having another uh, AI winter. Um, so I mentioned already uh, some of the next steps in terms of mapping. So if we derive knowledge from a task and we have a related but different task, then we would hope to be able to use that knowledge uh, to, so that we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, and, and, and also use that knowledge so that we can guide the learning towards, in this case, more anatomically relevant concepts. Um, incorporating multimodal uh, learning here is, is, is crucial. Doctors don't make decisions based only on the images. So they consider a number of modalities such as blood tests. So you have your x-ray and you also have some other tabular data to consider. And uh, typically a decision is made by putting these together. Um, and and uh, of course, systematic evaluation and applications in medicine. I think medicine is, is, a, is a very important area for, for neurosymbolic AI, um, probably the most important. And um, to be able to show that this NESI cycle, neurosymbolic cycle can actually deliver uh, and address those limitations that, uh, that I was talking about. Uh, so right at the bottom here, I'm plugging the, the NESI workshop uh, this year, 2022, will be in September in, in Windsor in the UK. And this is the web page if you'd like to attend. Um, and before I stop talking, just to relate to accountability, I talked a lot about knowledge extraction. And um, this paper here on, on, on the right, um, was written with colleagues from Playtech, uh, a gambling operator software company. And they use machine learning to try and protect players from harm to make recommendations or predict whether someone should take a break from, from gambling. Um, and we've done some work on knowledge extraction uh, in, uh, in using the systems that, that they had. Um, and in this paper, we look at how to go from knowledge extraction to accountability, which is something that early on, I wasn't really concerned about. I was really only interested in the algorithms and the proofs and so on. Um, but I think it's fair to say that knowledge extraction is probably only the easiest aspect of accountability, um, but it needs to be there. So. My point is that we need to have knowledge extraction and a lot more. And this paper discusses some of the other components uh, of real accountability um, to be able to um, trust such systems and have them deployed in, in uh, safe and fair ways. I didn't say much about fairness, but you can think of these constraints that and these rules as fairness constraints. So they may come from the data, but they may also come from uh, some high level decision in terms of targets, for instance, and then we would like to impose those. 
So in, in, in a nutshell, the paper is available online, but we need to go from principles. There have been many principles put forward. Arthur, I don't know if it's me, but I cannot hear you. Me neither. No. Me ah, okay. Neither. Okay. Well, it seems we have some problem with the connection. Well, this is unfortunate. Well, let's wait, I don't know, a couple of minutes uh, to see if the speaker can reconnect. And otherwise, I don't know, we have to finish here the talk in a very dramatic way, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Yes, I think so he has disappeared. Yeah, I guess there was a problem with his connection. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe his laptop's battery, I don't know, run off of battery. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we can wait uh, five minutes. Uh, yeah, something maybe. like that. OK, you can, you can uh, maybe you can write in an email. Uh, Anyway, if he, uh, if he has a connection problem, sorry. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, how well, to connect with him. Yeah, yeah, I will check him an email in any case. Ah, yeah. Hi there. I'm hey. back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me Hopefully. Share, yeah, yeah. Let me share again. Uh, I think I was talking about accountability. Yes, exactly. And, exactly. Um, well, not from the beginning. Um, yeah, I was, I think I was basically saying that. Uh, I would argue these are the main steps, internal audit, data sharing, external scrutiny, and ultimately accreditation. Uh, in this order, because some companies have argued and opened themselves to external scrutiny without having internal audit and, and data sharing, and that didn't seem to work very well. We can see the, the problems with Facebook. And so the paper addresses uh, some of these issues and as part of this process looks at uh, knowledge extraction as a case study uh, at Playtech. Um, and in this process, uh, we hope to be able to address algorithmic bias, uh, but also education is an important component, right? And we will have to discuss issues of um, uh, educating experts in AI as well because the human in the loop approach, which is frequently used, uh, referred to as the solution to some of the problems is, is, is a bit unfair. So the idea that a domain expert is expected to override a system, the system has had access to millions of data points, the expert will never have access to that in their lifetime. And yet they are expected to take the liability and override the system. I think this is going to become uh, more and more uh, complicated. And so, yes, a human in the loop approach is important. We need to provide the tools such as these visualizations I mentioned, but also to empower the expert uh, when make the, making the decisions if they are ultimately liable uh, to those decisions. 
but in some cases, in some cases of autonomous systems, uh, this is going to be insufficient, the human in the loop approach. So yeah, a lot of exciting stuff, um, many uh, 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 systems and theoretical aspects uh, to be addressed, applications of, of huge relevance, uh, but at the same time, some challenges. And I touched on some of those technically and quite specifically extraction of meaningful concepts at the right level from very large networks, reuse of these concepts in related applications, closing the neural symbolic cycle and solving the question of computational complexity there uh, and scalability. Um, and in the case of um, the, the range of different logics that are available out there, uh, First order logic, particularly relevant because it allows you to also model uh, temporal logic, but also normative systems. And using such rules at the right level of abstraction, as opposed to at the level of the data, so that we can truly combine uh, data and knowledge in, in these systems and learning and reasoning in, in, in a principled way. Uh, Thank you, I'll, uh, I, I spoke too much. Uh, happy to take questions if there are any. Oh, well, the timing for, was perfect, no, no worries. Thanks. So now time for questions. Um, okay, so Carlos, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. And my okay. question is about uh, when you talked about uh, fidelity, because I didn't quite understand how you calculate the fidelity in explanations. For example, when you talked about uh, how you uh, calculate the perturbation to, to, for a change of class. So if you could repeat that part, thank you. All right, yeah. So we define fidelity as this difference between um, what is being estimated by the surrogate model, which in this case is the regression the equation, and what we are getting from the actual model, which is the neural network. Uh, so given a data point, we are interested in explaining this by saying that, well, if I were to change uh, this variable by this much, the classification would be different. And so this is what we use to measure fidelity. What the neural network is telling us in relation to this uh, change versus what the simpler regression equation is, is telling us. So once I have this equation, Remember, I'm trying to explain this is as a local method. I'm trying to explain just this one instance here. The fact that glucose with this value and blood pressure with this value gives me a 69% chance of diabetes. And um, I drive this equation. And what this number here is telling me is that everything else remaining the same if I were to change the glucose levels from 0 0.537 to 0 0.014, I would flip the classification. So the model wouldn't give me more than 50% in this case, chance of diabetes. Right? So it's this uh, uh, this um, explanation counterfactual explanation that I'm trying to make sense of and measure. So, okay, so this, this, this distance here is what the neural network is telling me. And this is what the regression model is telling me. And so I'm, ba I'm just uh, looking at um, the difference between the two. So basically, uh, 
you have a regression model that tells you if you change the glucose level to that value, uh, the class like will flip and do, and when I'm biactual, you it's like the class prediction by that value that your network, I mean, but that your regression model is telling you that will flip the class. That's so right. That's... So, so the neural network, um, so if, if I change it to, to, to the first value, the neural network will flip the class. If I change it to the second value, the regression model, which is supposed to provide my explanation, will flip the class. And do they agree or not, right? So if the fidelity error is, uh, is, is low, then these two numbers are very close to each other. If the fidelity error is very high, then the regression is saying one thing and the neural network is saying something else. And do you need like a regression model for that? Can you directly use the neural network and see in what direction you need to move like that a variable in order for the network to change its prediction? Like you need to use a simpler a regression model and not the entire neural network for that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, not so much a simpler model, but an equation. So um, in order to, 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 to be able to say, this is a counterfactual explanation, um, We argue that if you do this as in SHAP, um, you, you will be just obtaining any counterfactual explanation. And you will not be measuring it. You will be just finding one possible uh, way of flipping the, 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 the class. Uh, and that may be a very irrelevant explanation. It may be even an impossible uh, uh, change to make, but that's not the main point. The main point is that we argue that we do need an equation, as you see here, um, to be able to provide a counterfactual explanation with respect to that equation. Right? So we, we don't want any um, counterfactual explanation. We want the smallest change that I may need to make um, to flip the classification. And you need the equation for that, right? And you need the equation for that because it's with this equation that we say, well, this is, if I accept this equation as my explanation of the model, then now I can, I can actually change these values and find the, the counterfactual explanations that matter, as opposed to any uh, change in any direction that would provide an explanation that is not uh, really relevant. Okay, thank you. Hey, so there's another question. Natalia, please go ahead. Hello, thank you for the, the nice talk, uh, Arthur. Um, actually, Regarding the previous question, uh, do, is there, um, it generated me this doubt as I hear you, um, is there a way still that you enforce plausibility of the, of, of this uh, counterfactual, like? Um, the plausibility, you mean in terms of whether it's actionable? Exactly. Yeah, we, we didn't explore that. But again, with the equation, so imagine you have age in this equation. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't then consider, well, if you were to drop your age, uh, you, you would uh, uh, obtain a, a, a change in the classification. So there are some impossible changes. Uh, but we didn't look at that systematically. Uh, that's probably going to be application specific, but mm -hmm. it probably highlights also the need for this equation, right? Which then an expert may need to consider, well, what are the variables that can be changed and in which range? And once you have that, the way to calculate the counterfactual explanations is simply to plug those. So for any new example, 
um, if I'm happy with this equation, I can plug that example and change and, and, and analytically calculate the value for any of the variables with respect to all the others. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's the idea. Okay, and because, sure, I guess it's not easy in any case. It's not easy, no, yeah. no it's certainly, yeah. Um, uh, so I wonder how this uh, example you are showing right now, it will scale to the case of the COVID. Like my, my original question is this one. So is it key mm -hmm. to detect the pleural effusion or COVID, a previous implementation step on key areas of interest? Or, or is there other intermediate step that you have learned to be key in the compositional aspect of uh, XI or in the more broad uh, Nessie sense that helps so, explaining. Yeah, so so the segmentation is very important. Yeah, so I didn't really say much about the the clear application on the chest X-rays. So uh, it's interesting to look at the transfer learning. So that's why the pure effusion data with the COVID data. Um, but even if we just focus on one data set and classification task, let's say classifying pleural effusion versus a healthy chest X-ray. Even if we just focus on, uh, on that, uh, the work that we did with CNNs um, produces a number of rules. I think we have them here. Uh, and, and it's interesting that it's a quite compact set of rules for pleural effusion versus healthy uh, chest X-rays. Um, but we need, we need to validate this uh, with experts. Fidelity is high, but we need the user studies now um, because some of these um, concepts may not be uh, acceptable uh, for, for the doctor. Um, in the case of CLEAR, uh, going back Going back to this, I didn't tell you much about the actual system, but there is a GAN actually doing the segmentation and that um, has quite an impact in the explanation of the classifier. So, um, so we are still really exploring uh, what's happening here, uh, not only in the case where uh, the fidelity is not high and we need to improve the fidelity as in the bottom right there, but also, so in, in the case of CLEAR, you have a GAN, um, you create a contrast image to identify the segments, and then you apply the regression. So your equation includes, instead of glucose and, and blood pressure, it includes segment one and segment five. Uh, and, and then you can say, well, what if I remove this uh, segment one and uh, make it healthy? Uh, what happens. So it's exciting stuff, but it's more complicated uh, when it comes to trying to obtain a diagnostic system that is fully explainable from, from this. Yeah. Still some work to do there. Okay, because yeah, here you don't have a ground truth uh, annotations from experts, right? I understand. Correct. Yeah, so in, so in this data set, we, we, we did. So on the left there, that's a, a, what a medical doctor said oh, yeah, had yeah. to be the focal point. But you're right that in general, you don't. Yeah, so yeah. For, for the COVID data set, we don't. We have it for the pure effusion data set, but not for the COVID data set. And, and in that case, all we have is the fidelity measure. And, uh, and if that fidelity is not very high, as in, so we couldn't obtain very high fidelity in this case here. Um, then we know it's wrong, but we need to fix it. And so that's the, that's the next step, right? How to, how to then um, use this knowledge to improve the performance of the system itself. And like you said, closing, closing the cycle multiple times. And, and I think that requires the doctors to be in the process. And so this is the, the other challenge. So the educational component that I mentioned right at the end has to do with this as well. So I think it's quite important to have some form of co-design um, and better ways of interacting with the system so that we can increase trust. 
Definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so thanks a lot. I don't know if uh, it seems that we don't have any more questions. No. Thank you. There are, there are some comments in the chat. I can. No. Well. No, it was all, all covered, right? Exactly. Cool. Yeah. All the questions in the chat are answered already. Yes. Great. So, well, Arthur, from my side, again, thank you very, very much. Thank you so accepting. much. I'm glad that we finished with more people than we started. So, yeah, yeah, of <laughs> course. No, I, I thank think... you very much. Hope to see you uh, yeah. face to face at some point, either in either in London or or maybe I'll uh, visit you at some point. Yeah, I hope so. I, I'm pretty sure that everybody enjoys a lot, enjoyed That'd a lot this presentation. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.